Well, my name is Travis Doucette, and I'm so excited to be here with my friend, Bob Fitz. Um, I met you, Bob, many, many years ago, and uh, it's so great to reconnect all these years later. Uh, for those who don't know, Bob Fitz is one of the most popular, best-selling worship leaders in the Integrity Hosanna Music Series. Uh, he's been leading worship since the 1970s. He's been a part of dozens and dozens of albums as a worship leader and songwriter. Uh, his latest project is called Abundant, which came out in 2019. And you can go to bobfitz.com to check that out. And as I mentioned, our, our paths first crossed nearly 25 years ago when you did a worship conference up in Barrie, Ontario, Canada. And we've had the privilege of crossing paths uh, a few times since then. Bob, so great to, uh, to be with you and to interview you great. today. Great to be with you again, Travis. Awesome. This is great. Well, Bob, um, some know you because of your longtime association with YWAM, which predates your ministry as a worship leader. Can you share a little bit of what you were doing with YWAM before your first project with Integrity and some of the significant things that you experienced in YWAM and maybe some of the relationships that helped prepare you for worship ministry? Yeah, sure. Actually, uh, my my ministry in worship actually predated my involvement with YWAM because okay. I was a youth pastor in California. And I was youth pastor worship leader at a, at a church there in Southern California. So so that was actually the thing that um, I was actually coming to Hawaii to do uh, to have a Sabbath to do some songwriting because I was feeling very strongly um, that God wanted me to pursue songwriting. And so I had gone through a music seminar here in Kona back in 78, 79. And uh, when I went back to California, I, I thought, you know, I, I should probably go spend some time writing in Hawaii. And while I'm there, I could just attend YWAM meetings and stuff because they just gotten this new facility here in Kona. And so um, I contacted them and said, look, I'm coming to do some writing. Uh, would, would you, uh, could I sort of connect with you and you could be sort of a church for me while I'm there? And, and they said, oh yeah, well, you can do that, but you should probably do it at the discipleship training school. <laughs> and I thought, my thought at the time was, dang, I, you know, I don't need another youth camp. I, I, I've led youth camps. I, you know, that was kind of my uh, idea of what was going to happen. But, but came over here, and my wife and I both did. My six-month-old son uh, was with us, and we did a six-month school. Uh, <clears throat> and it really impacted us. And so we decided they asked us to stay on as school leaders, and we did that. And. It was interesting, Travis, because uh, it was during that time that it was kind of like a laying down all of the, the music thing. I thought, why am I, what am I doing here? I came here to, to pursue, you know, songwriting and, to, and, and the whole music thing. I, and, and Lord, you know, I, I know I'm, sp I'm supposed to be doing this with a youth of a mission. It just seemed like, a, you know, uh, I'd, I'd laid it all down. And it is actually, in fact, it was through my involvement with Youth of the Mission, because they asked me then to be a worship leader here, um, that YWAM has its own, I mean, it's like everything, you know, it's got this sort of underground network that, that you know, when you'll introduce a song and, and they'll have a school and it'll go to Russia and it goes to South America. And it goes, so what happened was it became this little... Um, yeah, like, like its own distribution network. And that's really um, my involvement with YWAM became God's supernatural way of, of uh, getting some of the songs out. So it was God's brilliant. <laughs> Can I say that? He so is, that, he's, that the was best, he's the best marketer. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Now, I, I know other artists have had connections with YWAM, and I was curious to know, like I know Twyla Paris had origins there. Yeah. Did you ever cross paths with Twyla oh, or yeah. other artists? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. She, in fact, that seminar that I mentioned earlier, Twyla was there at that seminar. And I, um, I remember she, we, we all had opportunities to present some of our, our, our songs, and, and uh, Twyla got up to the piano and sang a song, and I just melted in the seat. I went, wow, this, this lady has got such a gift. And it wasn't long after that that she um, released some of her, you know, Warriors, a Child, and, and just some of the brilliant classics that she wrote. Fantastic worshiper. Yeah. Do you remember but, what song it was that she sang that kind of floored you? Um, you know what, Travis? I, I have tried to remember that song. I wonder if it was uh, Who Will Glorify, because that was kind of one of her earlier. <clears throat> it was. Yeah. Actually, I've got an interesting story about that song. I, you know, while involved with YWAM, um, Keith Green uh, was killed in a plane crash during that time. 
And I had written a song called Take My Healing to the Nations and Wyman had sort of picked it up and used it as a, a, a theme song for the 84 Olympics and, and stuff. And so they, after Keith passed uh, away, they asked me to be part of a um, memorial concert tour. And again, I was laying down all this stuff, you know, it was traveling without my fan, without Kathy and it was real tough and uh, nothing was happening with the music. And, and uh, one day I heard Twyla had just released We Will Glorify. <laughs> I just broke down crying. I, I, I was, because it was so anointed and I had such the desire in my heart to, to honor Jesus in that way. And I remember just, just weeping and getting with some of the other guys on the team. Cause I was, we were doing a travel tour and it was tough and uh, just really had these people surround me and pray for me. And it wasn't long after that, that God said, okay, you know, you know, I've got my timing and all this stuff. You just, just let me do it. <laughs> totally. Just about being faithful with what's immediately in front of you. Yeah. What opens the doors. Um, are there any other artists that come to mind that you would have crossed paths with that kind of had a YWAM association? Yeah, um, quite a number of them. Uh, but but I don't know that a lot of them would, would be people that folks would recognize now. Dallas Home was in Texas. And, and then there's a group called Mylon Lefebvre and the Broken Heart. Was oh, yeah. Another, another group that we you know, sort of cross paths with. And uh, I'm sure I'm forgetting all kinds of people. I mean, obviously... And I, we talked a lot about this when we were in Florida with you. Um, the second chapter of Acts were super impacting on my life. And, um, and we were just really honored to get to, get to know them and, and during that time. So they, were, they had an association with YWAM, though they weren't. Uh, none of those guys were actually part of Youth of the Mission. <laughs> uh, they were just associated. So, yeah, there were a number of folks. Did Annie, Nellie, or Matthew ever sing on any of your projects? Yes, they did. And, and that, that in itself was like one of those God moments where you, know, you just sort of pinch yourself and say, can this really be happening to me? Uh, because incredible. She, yeah, what a songwriter. I mean, God has so blessed the church over the millenniums, you know, with, with these fabulous artists who write songs that change the world. And, and I believe that the second chapter were in that category for sure. Although they've pretty much disappeared off the map these days. But um, yeah, I had been invited to do my first integrity project. And um, so I traveled to, I think it was St. Louis was where Tom Brooks was, uh, had his studio at the time. <clears throat> Went in to do some uh, prep work for the songs that we'd chosen and Lo and behold, as we started <laughs> recording at a front door, some you know someone was at the front door, and I, someone said, "Yeah, Annie, Annie is here," and I said, "Annie, who?" And they explained that she'd come to sing backup vocals on the Lord Reigns, and and again, I, I just, I, you know, it's it's those kinds of things where you don't worship people, but you honor the wonderful gift that they have and that's important i think and so yeah that was a real special moment for me that's incredible bob um it's been said that it only takes one song to launch a music ministry uh prior to your first recordings with integrity you mentioned this you cut an independent album called take my healing to the nations and it concluded with a song that got some significant traction and when i say significant uh people that are watching this need to know that this song that you wrote when you were a young man is in hymnals now. Um, and that of course is blessed be the Lord God almighty. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that song and how the Lord used it to open up opportunities? Yeah. You know, Travis, the, the, uh, I, I guess one of the richest lessons that I learned when I first moved here to Hawaii from California and, and it was a tough move. You know, people laugh when I say that, you know, we, we Kathy and I just had bought a new home in California. We're planning in, being in ministry there for a number of years. And we just felt like God said, it's time for you to go to be in missions, be a part of a missions organization. So it was hard. And in fact, they put us in this, 
the housing that we had was was this rat infested shack you know uh, and uh so it was quite a nosebleed from where we were in California. And we, we get to this place and again, we're saying, what are we doing here? This just seems like such a, such a, you know, a drop in, in doing anything. Cause I, I wasn't really involved in a lot of ministry. It was just kind of bas basically holding the fort down in this little place. And uh, I'd been asked to sing at a little local fellowship here uh, in this little town, Kela Kekua. It's kind of famous um you know in folklore in Hawaii but um so I said sure and I and I thought you know I don't know a song to I don't know what I should sing so these people I don't know I'll just write a song and present it as you know as something that <laughs> that we know so so God gave me the song blessed be the Lord God Almighty and so I thought okay well I'll, I'll do it tomorrow morning so I got up in front of the people and my mind just went completely blank I I could not remember it for the life of me. And the night before it was like so rich and it's just one of those kind of songs that and I'm sure you, you're aware and other songwriters know this, that there's the moments where God just, you know, sort of flows through you. And so I just kind of sang in the spirit for about two minutes or so. And then, <laughs> and then uh, I was walking home because I was only like a block or two away from this church, walking back to our little shack and uh and it came back to me so i thought okay i better i better get in there and put this you know get this down so i went in and, and back in the days of cassette recorders and i and i put this on a cassette and, and that was kind of how this, the the song got <laughs> was birthed but then i began to sing it at ywm meetings and stuff and that was where it began to go out and around the different places around the world yeah <clears throat> incredible and so incredible like that must that must be mind-blowing that that publishers um you know some people when they think of hymns they think of oh yeah people well, that lived 100 120 150 years ago and and you can open many contemporary hymnals today and there it is worlds of music by bob fitz blessed be the lord god almighty how cool is that it's 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 I, you know i don't i don't have really a word for it you know i, I suppose every one of us have those moments where you you sit back and say, God, you know, I, you know who I am and you know how, how I'm nothing un, unless you're there. And so, and, and not meaning to be, you know, self-effacing or anything, but just, it's the truth. God loves to take people that are just people and do supernatural things. And, and it's a, it's a humbling, it's an awesome thing. I love that word. Awesome. It just strikes awe in me to realize that, you know, I'll go around the world and I'll start singing that song and people that I, total strangers will start singing it you know <laughs> so it's that's very incredible. humbling it's absolutely incredible well your first um your first album for integrity that you already mentioned was the lord's Re lord reigns with tom brooks producing um and this project uh, became an instant classic in the series had a handful of songs when i look back at the the, the track listing i'm like man we sang <laughs> that we sang that we sang that so there was there was something really special about this record. Before we talk about it, I want to play a clip of uh, one of uh, one of the songs that you made popular, not written by you, um, but this is Victory Chant. So let's yeah. uh, let's have a quick listen here. Hail Jesus, you're my King. Hail Jesus, you're my King. Your life frees me to sing. Your life frees me to sing. I will praise you all my day. So immediately when I hear that, Bob, it, it brings me back to, to my <laughs> childhood 
and just uh, being being at that church up in Barrie, Ontario, Canada, and that's uh, so cool. Our, our token acoustic worship leader just like like getting into it, but. <laughs> This was a great album. Songs like Victory Chant, Mark L. Trogi's I Stand in Awe. Oh, man. And that's the one that Annie Herring sang on. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then, of course, um, you know, your, your song, He is Lovely, which again got a lot of traction. Many of these songs found their way into churches across the world. Can you bring us back to this first recording? How were you approached to do it? How did it all come together? And what do you remember about the night that you recorded it? Well, as far as how it all came together, I um, had a very close relationship and still do with uh, publishers uh, called Scripture and Song. And they were the first ones that expressed interest in some, some of the songs that I'd written. And so I was very grateful for them. They had a close relationship with both Maranatha Music and with the, the founders of Integrity Music. And when, when uh, they had expressed interest, Integrity had expressed interest in doing a recording with, uh, in a mission setting. And so um, David and Dale Garrett, uh, the founders of, of Scripture and Song, had said, look, why don't you work with Bob? He's there in Hawaii with YWAM, with you for the mission. So I, at the time, um, that would have been in right around 80, 88, and I had released Healing for the Nations in 85, and somehow it had started going around the world. And so as a result, I'd been doing a lot of traveling, and the guys with integrity could not get a hold of me. And I, I wasn't aware that they were looking for me. So it was, you know, I was totally unaware of this. So I was in, happened to be in California and got a call from a stranger, a person I didn't know by the name of Mike Coleman. And he, so I, I didn't know who it was, but, you know, I, I, uh, answered the phone and was chatting with his Bob. My name is Mike Coleman. I'm from Terry Music. And he goes, you are a hard guy to get a hold of. <laughs> said, oh, you know, I'm part of Youth of the Mission. We go around the world and that sort of thing. And then he explained their, um, the, the, the desire to do a project recorded in Hawaii here. So I was thrilled. I said, absolutely, would love to do it. So... Um, in answer to your set, the second portion of your question, uh, the, what I remember about that night is that we recorded it at what was at, at the time known as the uh, Kona Surf Hotel. There was a big convention center there. And uh, there's a lot of Hawaiian memorabilia around, some of it historic and you know, really, uh, really uh, valuable stuff that was in, in uh, kind of those glass cases around the hotel. And one of them was a... <clears throat> a drum, a, a log drum uh, that they use to, to make these uh, pounding sounds, you know, with these sticks and stuff. And so Tom goes, wow, wouldn't that be great if we could use one of those? And, and so, they, so they went to the hotel manager and the guy says, absolutely not. Now, I, I hope I don't get in trouble for this, but somehow, some way, they were able to finagle getting out that ancient Hawaiian log drum and record the sounds in studio. So those those pounding sounds that you hear are from an ancient Hawaiian, uh, you know, I don't know what they call it, but it was a, it was like a drum sound. And uh, when I found out later on, I thought, Lord, I, I hope, I hope I'm not persona non grata, you know, around here anymore because of that. But yeah, that was, that was one of the things I remembered. Yeah. So was the album recorded in just like um, a conference room uh, at the hotel? Yes, it was in a, in, uh, it's like a, a big, big uh conference center yeah yeah, yeah. the ballroom yeah. yeah and how many people would have been in attendance for this first recording probably about 1500 yeah and and that for for that particular place was quite a crowd because hawaii is very isolated and people had heard about it all the way over in oahu and maui and so a lot of them flew over for the recording it was quite quite a quite a lot of folks yeah was and there... they did things differently back then they it wasn't alive it, they they had all of all of the recordings back then tracks were laid down by Tom. And then we, we rehearsed with a choir beforehand. And then we did it live that night with the crowd and the choir and the tracks. You mentioned, uh, you mentioned Annie, you mentioned Tom. Were there any, was there anybody else on that first record that you remember kind of looking over your shoulder and like, oh yeah, you were there. You played on that record or you sang on that record. You were there that night. Uh, 
No, not, not so much except Don. You know, Don was there and uh, Don and Marty Nystrom were there because in the lead up to um, us doing the recording, I had met with him on the mainland uh, in California a couple of times just to get to know them. And, sure. And uh, I, I, you know, Don, uh, this was back in the day when the white sneakers were all popular. I don't know if you remember that, but everybody was wearing Reebok white sneakers. Yeah. And I remember going in to meet Don and there he was with those, you know, righteous white sneakers on you know <laughs> it was it was he's a great guy what a what a special brother he's been to me yeah so That's he was great. there Marty was there a few others i want to play another song from that record this is one you did compose this is uh he is lovely from the lord reigns he is So just a lesson in songwriting, um, just such a beautiful <laughs> chorus. Tell us a little bit about that song, because I know that that was one that gained a lot of traction for you as well. It did. Yeah, Travis, it was. Uh, <clears throat> that song was written actually <clears throat> to one of my staff members in one of the schools that I was leading. Um, we had a little uh, tradition that we would do where we would bless each other. Secret, secret pal, I think they used to call it, where you would choose names. Uh, amongst the staff and then secretly bless people they wouldn't know who's doing it you know kind of thing and my wife and I were we had just uh, you know we're just getting settled in here from California and it was a super difficult financial time yeah, I mean just we had nothing I didn't when I this particular person on staff that I drew her name um, she just represented to Kathy and I that <laughs> I don't know how to say it the Sort of, if you have Christian in the, uh, you know, if you're looking up Christian, you look up that name, and there's her picture. She just so displayed the the beauty of a person of good good character and walking through difficulty and maintaining a sweet spirit, you know. So I thought I've got nothing to give. I got no finances to bless her with. I can't buy her a gift. I'll just write a song. So so I went down um, <clears throat> to this little church. You would love it, Travis. It would blow your mind. This little, little, tiny church from the revival days of Hawaii. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's like 20 by 50. Beautiful little chapel, but just across the street from where we, we had our school from the 1800s. And I walked inside that, that building and I sat down with my guitar and I said, God, give me something to give to Janice. And, um, and that's where that song was, was birthed. And, and, uh, you know, just basically saying it to her. As, so, so in that sense, it was kind of an interesting song congregationally because, uh, you know, it starts out, I can see that you love Jesus. And so I sometimes when I sing that song, I'll say to the congregation or the crowd there, I'll say, but guys, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sing to you. I know that's uncomfortable. Um, you know, people hate it when worship leaders, you know, tell you to look into the neighbor's eye and sing a love song to them. but I just feel like that there's this beautiful um, interaction between us and God that pulls down that barrier. There is no difference between me looking at you and saying, hey, brother, God bless you. And knowing that at the same time, because you're a son and a child of God, that I'm blessing my father. So, <clears throat> so that's difficult sometimes to make that transition. But when you get to the chorus, it's obviously lifted to Jesus. So it makes Love it that. I love that. Now, um, you know, at this point, the song that was probably giving you the most traction was Blessed Be the Lord God Almighty. Was there a reason why that was chosen not to be a part of Lord the Lord Reigns? No, I, you know, I, I, I don't really know. Uh, back then, you know, because it was my first experience with integrity, um, I was pretty much, you know, uh, hands off saying, look, you know, I'd love it if you could use some of the songs I've written, but I'm just honored to be chosen to, to do it. So, you know, they had a, a real um, 
complicated and uh, very um, multi-level choice uh, situations. So they had lots of songs to choose from. And I, I feel like that might've been part of it. They just had such a wealth of you know, songs. Yeah, so, well, they, they chose, <laughs> the songs for that project were just, uh, were just incredible, a wonderful gift to the church. Um, <laughs> With the release of The Lord Reigns, there seemed to be a shift because most of the Hosanna recordings, because of Tom, of course, were very keyboard driven. And in many cases, the worship leaders either led from the keys like Don Moen or they led from the mic. But you, of course, lead from the guitar. And this project has a bit of a progressive acoustic feel to it. Did you sense that your leading from guitar was adding something new and different to the Hosanna series that perhaps hadn't been as well represented no, I, if anything, I felt I felt very inadequate in a way because I thought, oh man, gosh, Don's such a great keyboard player, and you know, I I play a little bit of keyboard, but nothing like you know most of the guys that had been working with Integrity. So in re in reality, I was just feeling, uh, gosh, it's just me and the guitar here. So um, you know, I felt a little a little bit inadequate in a way, but um, but it was just you know I thought, well, that they want me to do this, so this is this is who I am. I'll just go from where I'm at, you know, kind of a thing. But no, I didn't, I didn't ever actually think that, that way because I wasn't really that familiar with integrity at the time. Um, um, I had been more associated with Maranatha music right. um, because of my California roots. And, and Maranatha was, was a, sort of a stronger voice in California than would be say integrity, which is more, was, more more mid mid of the middle of the country or east coast did you play acoustic guitar on most of your albums for integrity yep i did oh, that's great well mm -hmm. less than two years later you recorded you recorded your next project for integrity which was called the highest place i want to pause and i want to play uh, a song after that uh, off of this project that you've become again very well known for this is uh, glory glory lord off highest place <laughs> So that's another one takes me back to my childhood. We, we never tried for those who know that song, they know that later on in the song, you, you sing the same lyric in different um, native languages. And we never tried to do that Grow, growing up. We could never do that. But that chorus, that simple chorus is, has gone all over the world. Um, how were you, how did, how did, how did the highest place come together? How were you asked to do a second project two years later? Um, you know, and was the Integrity family looking to come out to, for an excuse to come to Hawaii again? <laughs> Thanks, Travis. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I, I, it could well be that that was part of it, but um, I think that, uh, you know, be, because of the international nature of, uh, of the first one, the Lord Reigns, and, and how because of, in a way, because of YWAM's Youth of the Mission's influence that way, um, there was this awareness that of what God was doing in worship through integrity, which I think was, oh wow, this is this is just going crazy. I remember talking to Tom and him going, "You cannot believe how many recordings I'm doing." He was telling me something like he was doing like fifteen to twenty major recordings every year, and he was just he was strung out on both ends, you know, just doing all these different recordings. All that to say that there was this huge influence internationally. And I try to tell that to Mike whenever I speak to him, Mike, you just got to know that what you did increased the kingdom worldwide. So I think really it was just an awareness that, um, um, hey, th this is going all over the world and, um, and because you know, the title of the highest place is you know, really after a Ramon Pink's song, Highest Place, brilliant song. And there, there's just so many uh, examples around the world of, of deities and or philosophies that have sought to lift their, their heads above our God. And it's just so great to be able to say in confidence, Lord, we, we put you there. We put you because it's who you are 
And, and to be able to say that internationally, it's just fabulous, you know, to go, I've, I've, we've been literally all over the world, the planet, and gone to mountain peaks and, and sang that song with just me and a few other people and just said, Jesus, this is your planet. It's nobody else's. And we, we want you to know that you are worthy. You were on a mountaintop to give your life for us. And so, Father God, here on this mountaintop in Malaysia or russia or wherever we were you say jesus you are exalted it's just great isn't it you know there's something in our dna as believers that just finds this uh fulfillment in doing that yeah well this is great so so it sounds like highest place was just an extension and awareness of man there's this international uh there's a desire to hear the, the, these international sounds of people worshiping um mm -hmm. How are, how are the songs chosen for your projects? I noticed The Highest Place had a wide variety of songwriters, everyone from Dale Garrett, who you had mentioned earlier, to Graham Kendrick and even Leon Patillo. Can you share with us how your projects were planned, how the songs were chosen, and what criteria that you would evaluate or chime in with um, as to whether or not a song should be included or not? Right. Um, the I, I couldn't tell you uh, clearly because I wasn't in on the organization of their song choice, but what I do know, I remember observing it uh, a little bit from a distance because obviously they were asking me to, to give my input, and I, which I did, I, and Leon's song and Glory, Glory, and you know, a number of them obviously were because I wanted to uh, incorporate that international feel. Um, the, the idea, as I mentioned earlier, was if, if we're going to, if we're going to make a message in this recording, let's make it the nations. Let's make it, hey, folks, this planet belongs to Jesus, and he loves the people of the planet. And so let's find a way to somehow um, articulate that through the songs and so forth. With the song choice issue, I, I do remember sitting with uh, three or four representatives from Integrity, Integrity um, who had connections, obviously, at that time, uh, integrity had hit a, a point in their distribution and so forth that they were um, really sought after from publishers and that sort of thing. And so we would sit around uh, with a number of folks um, who had compiled uh, probably 30 songs and we would just discuss it and say, here, does this fit that criterion of of the nations and is this something that was easy to sing you know all the different things that we would look for to make them uh, uh, something that would really catch on with churches and uh, so so it was really it was great there were times when you know i had songs that i wanted to use that uh, just didn't get used and that was fine you know it's interesting you mentioned uh, blessed be the lord god almighty which a, a, a big chunk of the world calls it father in heaven uh, which is a little little briefer <laughs> But, uh, but Integrity never actually recorded that song, which is, which is kind of wild. Uh, Maranatha did, but Integrity never did, which... Interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. And, and uh, I think we had, we had talked about it on a number of occasions, but for some reason it just never got chosen. But in that process, particularly for Highest Place, you know, it was, a, uh, it was a definitely a corporate, several people, five, six people sitting around um talking about songs i remember we had a chalkboard that we you know there here's this song what do you think you know everybody gives us and then we'd cross off or we check yes let's use that one so it was yeah it was, it was pretty laborious in some ways were, were there any songs left off high place in the lord reigns that were used on later projects that maybe didn't feel right at the time but then you kind of revisit it and you're like oh let's go back to that or or you know let's uh you know i have this you know, seedling of a chorus, and maybe it wasn't quite ready for the project, and it was used on another project when you'd finished it. I don't remember any, uh, particularly uh, with Highest Place, that, that would be in that category. But I do remember with Glory, Glory, um, that, that I, I specifically being in a meeting with Mike Coleman and uh, David Garrett, uh, who, as I said, they were uh, eventually actually Integrity Music bought out the uh, scripture and song catalog. Um, and so they had a real close relationship. I remember sitting in that room thinking, we need to get something that, um, that, that, uh, that is going to be able to, we'll be able to sing in different languages because, you know, glory is a, is a very across the board 
kind of word. It's used in all languages. And so um, I remember thinking at that time, sitting with Mike and with David, thinking, you know, I need, this, I need to write a song that's, that's in that category. And uh, this will crack you up, and you won't even remember this song. But there was a song back then called Turn the Radio Up. Oh, yeah. Eric, sound. Eric Carmen. Uh, yeah, I love that song. I, I, and I, that was the kind of song I thought, dang, that is so easy to listen to and fun and you drive in the car, you know, or whatever. And I, so I remember thinking that was sort of a seed in my head for Glory, Glory. Obviously, it's quite different. Yeah. But that was the song that, that was kind of, I want it to be like that. <laughs> it, Eric Carmen's great. And just a little, little quick music trivia for you. Um, one of the Beach Boys, I think it's Al Jardine, I could be wrong, sings background vocals on that. He actually recruited, because that was the whole sound he's going for on that on that particular song. But that was Make uh, Me Lose Control, probably yeah. around 86, 87. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and but uh, it, see, I think it was 2000 when we were working. No, th no, that's not right. When was it that, that Highest Place came out? I think Highest Place came out um, 91, 92, around there. Oh, was it? Okay. I, th I, th I think it's around there. That's uh, correct. Lord, Lord Reigns is 89, and I think Highest Place was 91. That's right. No, that's right. Yeah, so that song obviously had stuck in my craw for a few years. <laughs> that's so great. I love that. So, Bob, you're an established and celebrated songwriter. Tell us, what are the characteristics of an enduring worship song. Wow. Characteristics of an enduring worship song. I, I think probably from a technical perspective, um, there's two aspects I think of. And, and that's obviously the, the, the main, the meat of the song, which is the chorus. And there's a number of things involved in that message, obviously, simplicity um, and singability. Those, those three things are, you know, all just, you know, simple things that people generally know, but maybe they don't know they know it, but but they know it intuitively. But I think the other aspect is is the song that crouches around the remainder of the song that crouches around the main message. Uh, if it's got a if it's got a good lead line into the chorus, something that that picks you up and and you just Every time you're cleaning the house or you're doing whatever you do, and there's that little lead line that uh, da 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 da. It's it's kind of like those leads lead-ins that says, "I want to go to that message. I want to go to that course." And I think, I mean, there's always things that break those little rules we make about songwriting, um, and I fully understand that. At the same time when we analyze successful songs as you are suggesting we do is is there's always those factors there that just simplicity and you know, something that you, you really want to sing when you don't have a band behind you and you're just washing your car and it just comes to your mind you know <laughs> like that one i mentioned to you earlier a secular tune but um you know, I have no problem with that. I, I remember when I was first filled with the Holy Spirit, I was just so, I love music. And so I listened to all kinds of music. And there was a song I, I decided I was going to fast and I'm driving down the road and the song comes on. Um, all I need is the air that I breathe and to love you. And, and I started crying. Hmm. But the Holy Spirit was right in, the, right in my car there with me to re help me to remember that chorus and, and, to, and to put it into my life as Jesus, that's all I need. I don't need food. I've got you. Yeah. So that's great. So the Hollies, a Holly song. <laughs> is that what it is? I, th I think the Hollies did the air that I breathe. That's great. I love that. So a year later, after, after Heist Place, you cut your next project, which is a Christmas record. This is a, this is a little bit different. This is a bit of a departure. And uh, it was called Bethlehem's Treasure. And I actually want to play the title track. We, we learned this at the church. We loved your music growing up, um, as you know, in Barrie, Ontario. And I remember singing this uh, as, as a kid. Uh, but those who know your discography may not be as familiar with this, but this is the title track of Bethlehem's Treasure.
singing with Kelly Willard. What a what a uh, what a voice. Yeah. How could I forget to mention her? Oh my goodness. Yeah, what a what a voice. Bob, the one thing that I think so many people um are blessed by, just a technical observation, the voice that the Lord gave you is just so full of energy. And just even even your ad libs and your singing in the spirit feels so effortless. And I think that's been one of the great things that even as I'm listening to these songs right now. I'm drawn into worship because uh, I there's a sense there's a sense that you are truly worshiping even in the, the the technical delivery of 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 how God gave you your voice and how you use it and I just think that's just so wonderful about your ministry. Oh, thank you, brother. I you know what I you and I both know what an honor it is to to take the the, the simple gifts we have and say, Jesus. This is nothing compared to what you've done for us, but here it is. Here's this little gift yeah. and do something, do something miraculous with it. <laughs> Amen. So, uh, so Bethlehem's treasure, um, a lot of people from Saddleback on this. You got Rick Munchow. I was just thinking about this because uh, this week Rick Warren announced his successor and I was watching the, the transition oh, wow. there at Saddleback. But the late Rick Munchow um, on this record, I don't recall a lot of worship Christmas albums in the 90s. So tell us why a Christmas project and what do you remember about this recording? <laughs> uh, it's so funny, you know, <clears throat> when they asked me to do this, um, I, I thought, oh my gosh, it's the death knell of my, my worship ministry. <laughs> uh oh, they've they're got me. Pretty soon, they're gonna do, pretty soon it's going to be a hymns project and <laughs> I, don't know. I, I thought that briefly but then when i had written uh bethlehem's treasure I, I was very uh i was kind of in one of those seasons where i think uh and again those who are listening will will, will identify with this is there are seasons that you go through with your gift you just feel i can't seem to connect here i'm not not mis i don't feel a, a sense of um you know a real favor on these things that i'm working on and I finished Bethlehem's Treasure and I sent it to the guys at, at Integrity you know, to look at. And uh, Don wrote me back and, and said, wow, Bob, we really love this song. We want to use this. And so it was a real encouragement. And I think for me at the time, that was the thing that, that said to me, okay, you know, because um, I'm, a, I'm a Christmas freak, even as my wife. I, when it comes to Christmas, I think this is the biggest billboard for Christianity in yeah. the world is uh, man throw a party give the gifts i've got nothing against christmas trees santa claus any of that stuff just blow it out big because this is honoring jesus so i thought this is the time you know because and i think don's because he's such a great encourager his word really made me know okay this is the time to do this because i was wondering oh man why are they pushing me into a christmas project <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, that's great. I love that. Um, who are some of the key musicians that you often were repeatedly working with on your projects? And do you have any funny stories or memorable moments of just like playing playing with some of your favorites? Well, Abe Laboreal is probably the, the most amazing musician. Okay, so I'm sorry, I'm using a lot of superlatives here. And, and I mean, when it comes to music, it's I mean, my goodness, you know, there's there's always somebody better, but but when it comes to him, I I don't know any person that is more gifted and yet more humble and just he recognizes you across a room and will call you out and you know, just just wow, hey Bob, how are you doing? And just you know, so I, I would say he was probably the one that I most I most really uh, uh, connected with in terms of that group of musicians that Tom often used, who were all brilliant, brilliant musicians. But but there's a couple other ones that I want to mention that were on Proclaimers Power, which you mentioned in our in our uh, intro discussion. And uh, Proclaimers Power was done in Nashville, and it was uh, done at it's it's a church where a lot of artists attend. It's a well-known church, and. Uh, I had asked some of my favorite people to do background, background vocals. Um, and uh, Paul Belosh and, and uh, Kelly Willard were two of my faves, and Lenny LeBlanc. And then 
And then I asked uh, an artist that I don't know if you'll remember, but her name was Jamie Owens Collins. Yeah. Parents, yeah. Yeah. Jamie's parents were just super well known the world over for writing Come Together, a musical that was was powerfully used during the, the Jesus movement and the charismatic renewal back in the um, 60s and 70s and 80s. Um, and Jamie had such an impact on my life. She wrote a, her first recording was called Laughter in Your Soul. Don't you love that title? It's just. I love it. And I know the project. Uh, and in second chapter of X sang BGVs on some of those songs on that project. And that's, and that is exactly why I was, I, I didn't know who Jamie was. I went, I was just in a record store one day and I went, oh my gosh, second chapter sings on this. It's got to be good. And so I, I played Jamie's recording. So, so Jamie was, is another one that she sang, um, she sang on, on that project called Famous Power. And then later on, I did a, a, a project on my own called Restore and Jamie, Jamie sang on that one. She, I tell her all the time, Jamie, get out there. We need your voice. We need you. I don't care. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter anything. We need, we need you. And she's, she's, uh, she's kind of not doing so much anymore, but I just, I just want to give kudos to her and her parents and say, yeah, they're, they're, uh, they're, a, they're a hoot, a lot of fun and just great sense of humor. But Jamie said that. Before. I'm so glad you mentioned her. Um, she recorded a project in the mid eighties called a time for courage. Oh yeah. And, um, some people are going to remember her song, uh, the battle belongs to the Lord. Oh, absolutely. Um, That's a classic, which is, which is a classic. Um, but for me, it was hearts courageous. She, she had yeah. a great song called hearts courageous and, uh, yeah. and those yeah. songs, you know, those songs still stand up today. Um, oh, absolutely. I'm glad you're mentioning proclaim his power. I want to play, uh, the song that she wrote for that project and co-leads on this is, uh, you have broke. You have broken the chains off of Proclaim His Power. <laughs> like that that i don't know if you still use that song when you go out but i love that imagery of you've broken the chains uh that held our captive souls you have broken the chains and you have used them on your foes on your foes is that it's such brilliant? a punch to the enemy like just <laughs> just a great uh you know we, we want to sing that we want to sing about the triumphant victory that christ has had over satan and over the principalities and absolutely uh, do you still use that song when you go out i do and and uh you know I, the challenge that i have right now is this, i'm in that season where god has beautifully raised up a whole new generation of songs and i and i and that means we did our job you know that means hallelujah we passed it on that's a good thing the challenge with with crowds is being able to say um um i, I need to weave through these two generations and can do that that's not a problem but yes and, and that's your question I do. And just got you playing that those background vocals. I mean, hello, Lenny, Lenny LeBlanc, you know, Paul, all, all those guys, just brilliant singers. And, and I'm forgetting um, uh, Lynn Albrecht, you know, yep. she, you know, who sang on so many of those not. She's, <laughs> Leanne sang on so many integrity projects too. her, her and Kelly, like, and, uh, just in voices that are instantly recognizable too. Absolutely, absolutely, yes. That was a that was a very special project and, and one that I'm I'm really grateful. I, I I told you the story before, but not long after it was released, I got this note from somebody in the UK. It, it came back and I said, "This is so refreshing. This is so different, so new." And it was little did he know what agony it was to doing the recording. But, yeah, tell us that story because I'm you've told me this before, but uh, tell us about some of the obstacles that you faced for Proclaim His Power. Well, um, I think back then uh, we were in, in, the, in the height of our, our ministry, you know, in terms of 
travel and that sort of thing. So I was going hither and yon, backward and forward, every which direction. And with the preparation for the project, uh, my voice was on the edge. And so I got to Nashville and to do rehearsals and, and I just knew there was gonna to need to be a miracle in my voice because it was not, it was not doing well. So I was drinking, there was this stuff called musician's friend, I think is what they called it, spraying it and doing everything. And I, I think I've, I finally was able to get back to it, but um, it was also very intimidating because I was there that night with, um, Don was gonna be opening and then they were sandwiching Don and then we would do the recording in the middle and then Ron would, would close out. And so I was surrounded with some really, really amazing people and full a room jam packed full of all kinds of um, really well known folks. Did, were they recording projects at night too, Don and Ron? Uh, you mean that night? Or? Yeah. Was yours the uh, only no. set that was? No, 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 no. That wasn't recorded. The only portion recorded was was my section. Okay. So so Don and uh, Ron were actually there just to kind of sandwich uh, in between, and. It was just a hard, hard evening because I, I got a first song, Broke a String, on you know, the first song. And you know, as a guitar player, it, it's not something you can ignore. You, you, you have to, you have to sure. fix it. So Kathy, while I'm strumming, because I didn't think we could stop, rips off the string, puts in another one, restrings it, and we keep going. <laughs> Incredible. I have That's more horrifying. people tell me, Bob, you know, you have the most amazing wife. She can change a guitar string mid-service. Mid Unbelievable. Well, despite these obstacles, um, man, you seem to capture the anointing on some of these songs. Mm -hmm. I think of Praise Him by Linda Shazel. Yeah. That stands out, that, to me, when I listen to that project, um, that stands out to me as a very... Oh, yeah. moment from this recording what's your memory um of recording that song and that moment in the set there was there was as you refer to there was such a um you know one of those moments where where as worship leaders we long for you know just that that moment where it's so sweet and tender that um you're having this intimate moment with the creator of the universe along with 2000 people and you're lost in your own world and and yet you're together the, the the most incredible that's not the right word the most astounding uh uh times in worship when you have that moment where we're married because we are the bride we're married to the to the king and yet we're married to each other at the same time it's just this uh it, you can't have it anywhere else like that so that, that was that moment. It's like having a wedding ceremony. I believe it. I believe it. That's awesome. Well, we should note that during this time in your life, you held a post as the director of the School of Worship at the University of the Nations in Hawaii. Can you share a little bit about how this opportunity came about and how long you served there and how it played a role, if any, in the worship projects that you recorded for Integrity? I don't know if you got to try some of your songs on your students first before they <laughs> recorded. Yeah, well, actually, I did. <laughs> In fact, one of the songs on on Proclaimers Power was from called "As We Pray," and it was was I wrote that for one of our prayer uh, times together as a school. But um, what happened was uh, when I first moved to Hawaii, um, because I had attended a music seminar and it had had such an impact on my life. Um, we we all know that the reason we do these this particular uh, project right now with you. It's multiplication. The issue is we want to multiply ourselves and through social media, whatever. So I, my father was a teacher and a pastor told me, he said, this is what you want to do is you multiply yourself. Jesus did this. And so do this in your, in your ministry. So I decided to do a two week seminar in Hawaii uh, after having had a successful impact on my own life. It was very good. Chuck Gerard was there. I, I could go down the list of a number of different people. But um, it went really well. And so the university chancellor came to me and said, Bob, this seminar did really well. We, we would 
what we found in the past is if you do a seminar that's successful, you should probably your next step should be to do a school. And, and the, the uh, template for schools and youth at the mission is six months, three months of classroom, three months out of, you know, taking what you've learned out to community. So I did not see how we could do that. I, I thought, how on earth am I going to take three months to transfer the heart of worship into people? I'm not sure how to do that. And I, anyway, we did it. We started the school and um, just uh, took, decided that our outreach session the last three months, we, we would circle the globe and worship. So we started in Hawaii, um, went to New Zealand, went to Pakistan, went to uh, the UK, went to Texas, went to Vancouver, and then back to Hawaii. So we, we took a team with us uh, from the school. And the, the, the prophetic aspect of it was, let's, let's, let's cover the globe in worship, believing that God, you're going to raise up worshipers around the globe. So we did that the first year. Second year, the success, second, second year, we had another successful school and went the other way around. So the, the whole idea, again, was to multiply. And it was, it was uh, challenging. Um, real quick little story here. It's so funny. You know, we're youth of the mission. We have no salary. It's all you know, basically so I'm flying home from, from a, uh, a, not that tour, but a different uh, ministry time. And I got bumped up to first class, which is, you know, I was flying a lot. So I sometimes we get bumped up. It was not something I paid for. They just bumped me up. So I'm coming in and the School of Worship staff had, de had decided that they were going to meet me at the airport. So I'm sitting next to this person in first class and, and I'm, I'm writing some stuff on the computer or whatever. And, and, and I look out the window. I'm like, oh, my gosh. And there were like 20 people from the staff of the School of Worship all waving and big signs and stuff. And the, guy, the guy looks at, and he's asking me, so what do you do? Oh, I, I do music. I, you know, I try to keep it as succinct as possible. And, and so he looks at me, sees people up there, he goes, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, and, he goes, and you know, I, I would have I would have really blown the guy away if I said, well, I'm, I'm a missionary. <laughs> But anyway, it was, it was, a, the school was good and it's still going to this day. How many years did you do that, Bob? I think we did it for three years. Yeah. And we started one in Montana and it's still going as well. So. Did anybody ever pass through that school that uh, would have written any songs that we would have known or, or has a worship ministry that we would be aware of? Yes, recently. But you know what, uh, Travis, I'm sorry to say, I, I don't even know their names. It, it's really funny. It's been long enough since we first started it that there are a few people in the school now who even know who I am. You know, so they they would know my name, many better. But recently, I was talking with one of the leaders of the school, and he said, "Oh, Bob, we have someone that's doing some stuff with Bethel now, and, and it's a name that people would recognize." But I I apologize. I I can't remember. <laughs> Oh, that's great. That's just so wonderful that the Lord used you in, in, in such a great way to start something that's still going today and that's still mm -hmm. equipping and training worship leaders. So that's just wonderful. It's a blessing. I'm grateful. That's awesome. Well, your 1996 project uh, with Integrity, He Will Save You, has a special place in my heart. This is the record that um, played in our household over and over and over again. And uh, I could go on, but but to say the least, it is, in my opinion, your best collection of songs. There's wow. not a bad track on this on this wow. record. The arrangements are stellar, and the flow of the set uh, feels very natural. Um, so uh, let's just play the, the the opening track. This is a song that you wrote from from the 1996 release. Uh, he will save you, and this is called "This Is the Day." <laughs>
so it, it just seems so natural that uh, a guy who has so much energy in his voice would pen such an energetic song. And that's, <laughs> that's one that we, uh, we sang a lot back in the day. Now for this project, you took a different approach. Um, it is live, but it's live in a studio in that's Nashville. Correct. Yeah. And uh, man, this, this album featured some amazing songs. Um, Don Harris's Lord Most High is on. Oh my goodness. We still do that one a lot. Yeah, just a great vertical song, right? A song that just describe unto the Lord the glory to his name. Just uh, nothing, not that there's nothing wrong with testimony, but there's just something that resonates in a different way when the lyric That's is right. completely pointed towards Christ. Absolutely. And then, of course, one of your most beloved songs, He Will Come and Save You, is off of this. Um, this is the day. And then, uh, and then they decided to have you cover Andy Parks' "The River Is Here," which I, <laughs> because we were so close to, we had a lot of vineyard influence at our church up in yep. Erie, Ontario, Canada, and, and really, you, your version of it kind of became the commercial definitive version. And also, your version of Dennis Jernigan's "You Are My All in All." um really became the most popular version uh, of it that was out at the time but well, what are your memories of this project i love this project so much bob yeah oh brother that is so i i feel such a connection with you that way and there's a, a good reason for that but I, I just wanted to say one thing real quick i i think it's so interesting because um dennis's tune and obviously he's a guy i highly esteem as a songwriter i mean he's brilliant and and i get more people who think i wrote that song and and because of what you were saying, I think it did it did sort of become the 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 widest release sort of uh, expression of, of Dennis's song. And it's it's such a humbling thing to be able to say, no, you know, folks, I didn't like that, but I know the guy who wrote it, and he is he's such a a saint, if I can say it, and not sound cheesy, but you know, he he really is. I love the brother. But I but the connection I mentioned with you on on that recording is that is that I, I, I love the song, He Will Come and Save You, because I had never read that scripture before. It's in Isaiah. It's literally taken straight out of Isaiah 35. And so I really didn't <laughs> write the song. In fact, in fact, Gary and I both, Gary Sadler and I both worked on the tune together. And uh, it's really straight out of scripture, pretty much. And, but I remember being in a, a season of great difficulty and just stumbling on that scripture. And it's so crazy because it was like God said, Bob, the cavalry's on the way. Don't worry about it. It's all good. Everything is good. And you know, that scripture just said it to me so loud and clear. It was like this clanging symbol that just went through my head, Bob, you're going to be okay. Don't worry. We'll survive this situation. Not just survive, we'll come out better. In it. And so, um, so when I hear people like yourself have that connection of heart, I know it's because we've all, as human beings, recognized our, our frail human condition and recognize that God loves to inject himself into that frailty. Yeah. That's so true. That's so true. And, you know, going back to kind of our conversation on songwriting, it doesn't surprise me that songs with the titles, This is the Day, He Will Come and Save You, Lord Most High, the, you know, Lord promises in His, in his word that his, his word will never come back void. Yeah. So when you write yeah. the word of God, God loves to hear his word sung back to him. That's right. And, and there's something that just causes those songs to to endure. So what else do you remember about this project? You, you went to Nashville, you're doing it live in a studio. Who, who was a part of it? What are your memories, um, song selection, any memories? Well, obviously the horn playing on that, the, 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 the hammered dulcimer, uh, the horns. Uh, I was just, on, when you were playing, this is the day I was just going, I love that little lick that he comes in with that horn there. And it's just, I, I was standing back in the recording, as you said, it was in studio, but there was a good sized choir there too. And um, just just watching these musicians use their skill was, I was in awe of it. But a couple of stories that really uh, uh, touched me during that time. One of them had to do with the choir. When we sang, when we did He Will Save You, I, I mentioned to the choir, I shared from my own experience and I just said, I want you all to know that while we sing this song that, 
that God's spirit is here to, to move amongst us. And I don't know, there was maybe, I don't know how many people were in the choir, maybe 200 or so, but said, how, however many people are here, there are going to be that many stories of God coming, whispering his, his, his saving moment into your life. And uh, wow, you know, as we sang it, you know, just people were just, uh, there, there was a lot of tears shed. And, and the second story is about Gary. Gary, who helped, was a, was a co-writer with, um, he will say, his father, and I hope I'm not um, speaking out of turn here, but his father was in a difficult situation at the time, uh, physically. And uh, I looked back into the uh, sound booth there where they had their equipment and stuff. And Gary had just tears streaming down his face. And when we finished, I walked back and we just hugged. There was just this sweet moment that says, our Father God loves to weep with those who weep and to, um, yeah, just to embrace the brokenhearted. He, he, he's so kind, our God. And so I, I think those, couple of months that just really touched me. I love that. I love that. Uh, any other uh, insight on how, like, again, I, I can't, I can't tell you now. <laughs> for those who haven't heard this project, beginning to end the song selection and the arrangements are just stellar. Was this a, uh, was this a typical, like they, they came to you with a collection of songs or mm -hmm. did you weigh in any differently with this specific set? Well, this particular project was a little different in that Tom didn't produce it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, so we had a little bit different modus operandi there. And um, so it was, it was a, a beautiful uh, sort of a kind of, I'm gonna be careful here. It was a fresh take on how to approach it. And sure. so that was good. It was good for us. And I'm sure Tom appreciated the break, you know, cause he needed it about that time. But um, Don Harris produced it and um, we did the, 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 the backup stuff uh, at his house there, I think it was in Nashville. But what I, what I remember about it specifically was Don, who is a great songwriter and a great bass player and a musician, his tender heart was so hard of, and perfect for this project. It was really a reflection of Don um, because, because he had that feel in him of He's just the kind of guy that you can sit sit down with, and he doesn't say a lot, mm -hmm. but but you can tell he's taking it all in mm -hmm. and feeling it all, and that's really I think what was reflected in how the flow of the project came out. The only thing that kind of kind of shocked me was was the fast version of "He Will Save You" at the end. <laughs> it was kind of like it was kind of like whoa, okay, <laughs> whose idea was that? You know, I'm not really sure. I'm, I'm not going to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, coming out of um, that Paul Balash song, I know I can do all you know, things. things. It was a yeah. great, you know, that's a great song. And I, I suppose it was just kind of like, like a tack on thing to say, hey, let's remember what we're here for. God's going to rescue you, which is a great thing. Uh, but I know every time I listen to it at the end there, I, I'm just going, wow, that, that's just like, that's different. 